Hey, everybody. Welcome back. Hey, Joe. Hi, Brent. Welcome, everyone, to another week here. They just keep trudging on here in Menaquis, the unceded territory of the Mi'kmaq, Pescatomacati, and Willistiquay people. Uh, we actually just heard we're going to have our very first powwow here in St. John, Menaquist on October 26th and 27th. Yeah, super Mark. Exciting. Mark your calendars for that one, folks. It's a really interesting. Mm -hmm. I've been listening to some Indigenous folks who are opening up a business here and listening to them talk about it to be the first kind of shared territory powwow. Um, St. John is, you know, part of that Tobik First Nation, but. It's always been considered as a shared territory between the Pescatomacati, the Mi'kmaq, the Wallastook, um, the whole group, because it's a, been a huge trading area. Um, and coincidentally enough, the name of the business that's opening here, uh, they're, they're getting really close, is the Trading Post. So uh, yeah. it's going to be a cool time to be in St. John um, in that, around October 26th. Uh, mark your calendars. We should actually have Dave from First Nation Storytellers on here sometime because the history Good of this point. area is quite interesting um, in just how it really wasn't any one particular communities like, you know, was, everyone's like, where, why isn't there a reserve or an Indigenous community in St. John? Yeah. Well, that's because it was very much shared and yeah. also we did a really good quote unquote job of removing a lot of indigenous people from this area and to more central parts of the province because it was such an advantageous place for colonizer colonizers and settlers to be for the big port and dave yes exactly and dave can explain that in deep deep detail yeah really and cool. even though we did that you know what's interesting you know as i hear stories and, and dave talked about the stories and so is um, eddie bernard former band chief of tobik he's down here listen to him speak about it brother's island um yeah. which is this little island in you know um in our region here um was used to help smuggle acadians off of boats so mm -hmm. acadians trying to flee deportation from the british um were helped by indigenous folks on brother's island and so there's some interesting stories some real kind of push back against the king and uh oh, yeah and, you know that kind of attitude and disposition here um and it always <laughs> it always surprises me in st john when i run into people who are just adamant um monarchs mon like monarchic folks who monarchists just, yeah monarchists who love the and i'm like man this city is strange for this yep. reason because you have these loyalists mm -hmm. you have irish separatists who and, like were basically as we know today the potato famine as we were told as children was sort of this oh why would the, what a peculiar summer they must have had or winter it was a bad winter but yeah. then you actually realize they were taking all the good uh the goods that were actually amazing and would have helped the irish people to give to the english so the reason that they were starved out of ireland was because of the english because they were starved out of ireland yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah um, exactly. so you know they hated the the english the indigenous the acadians here like it uh it always surprises me how people kind of skim over that and man anyway and i i wonder sometimes if there's still residual class differences between the ancestors of you know the irish versus the english versus the french um even to this day so yeah anyway. anyways <laughs> <laughs> so it's been another week for nb poly uh politics and uh for all of those out there who are like okay what's happening with andrea I, again i have to apologize and andrea if you're listening please Find some time for us and get back to me. Um, everything was going good, ticking along. And then all of a sudden last week, the day before, you know, conflict in the schedule. And I haven't been able to get anything back from her on that. So it is what it is, guys. Busy people. Um, we're a podunk little podcast, obviously. And no one, no one's really stepping in here to, to make the time for these interviews. But we'll, we'll continue on that road. I do have a request into Donald J. Savoie, author of um, um, Looking for Bootstraps. We've talked about that in the past, Economic Development Mind, who's shaped ACOA and other, other groups. And 
actually been quite uh, outspoken about how the approach. And uh, anyway, so he he asked me to kind of get back to him. And so I'm going to do that and uh, see if we can't nail that down. But for the most part, I think this is going to be our last pod for a couple of weeks. Um, so we'll be back next week. We'll be back the week after. We're going to go into a bit of an itinerant summer schedule um, just because we've got other stuff going on that we want to try mm-hmm. to uh, try to enjoy the summer, campaigns to run. And that's going to be one of our topics today, campaigns to run, campaigns to watch, um, as well as uh, some polling information, as well as some pastors in the mix. So anyway, let's get into it. Absolutely. So what's, uh, how do you want to kick this off there? I mean, I'm open here. I'm, I'm, it's up to you. We can start with, start with either topic. Well, in the last couple of weeks there, you know, we've been starting to hear some more rumors and more polls are going out more in like, we talked about the difference between those big pollsters and then the ones that parties do internally Mm -hmm. um, and sort of what those results might may or may not be showing. So it looks like uh, rumor has it that the Greens and the uh, PCs are actually leading in Fredericton Silverwood, which nope. is uh, the leader of the Liberal Party's uh, home riding, new home riding. Yeah, it's Susan. So, also, it's Susan, where Susan's running, but of course she jumped ship, right? Susan jumped ship from yeah. Bathurst, where she ran to get a seat, and I, uh, you know, we're trying to figure out. Uh, um, we're trying to figure out what it all means and who really cares about it. But that poll, and you know, I mean, we have to say it is, you know, secondhand information. Um, but so we didn't see the polling numbers ourselves, but the person who we were talking to, um, said that, Hey, this was a real surprise to everybody who saw it. Mm-hmm. It wasn't, um, I forget whose poll it was, whether it was an inside party poll. I think it was an inside party poll. Yeah. Um, and I think it was a liberal poll. Uh, I'm not, I can't confirm any of this. This is yeah, all yeah, I yeah. say. Yeah, yeah. So. so it was a partisan poll anyway, whether it was yeah. a liberal or a progressive conservative or a green poll. We reserve the right to gossip on this podcast. Absolutely. So. This is what we're doing here for. This is, <laughs> you know, it's funny. Like if we would have been on top of it, I could have announced last week that a friend of mine overheard Wayne Long talking in the bathroom at uh, the changing room at the aquatic center that he was going to call for Trudeau's resignation. And two Which days happened. later, he did. I missed that scoop. I could have t- given you. So we, we've got little birds in the air everywhere, guys. And um, folks love to Small tell us province. different things. Small province. And uh, and we love to talk about it because it always adds to the details. And the devil is in the details. And, you know, when it comes to polls like this, we were all, we were all a little bit surprised that Susan was choosing to jump back into Fredericton, even though that's where she lives, after running in Bathurst and winning the seat handily, right? So you've got an easy yeah. win. Um, yeah, it's in a place you don't live, but it's a place you ran, you went to door to door, you got the, you know, confidence of voters, you, you talked about their issues, you heard about their, their issues. And then, you know, a year and a half later, you jump. It's a risk. Um, but it's a risk that's aimed at the Green Party and the Liberals always do this, right? I mean, the Liberals hate the Greens, they hate the split on the left, they can't handle the fact that there's people talking articulately about their issues and getting support from people. And I, uh, you know, we saw in, um, in PEI, right? The Greens were the official mm-hmm. opposition there against Dennis King and the and the Conservatives. And then when the uh, Rick dropped and the, the, the PCs were doing really well in the polls at that time, um, the Greens were reduced from six seats down to two or eight seats, eight seats down to two. Anyway, um, official opposition status down to third place. The Liberals actually did win three seats. I mean, they have a small ledge. So, yeah. you know, these numbers are small. But, um, you know, they put the leader of the Liberals up against Peter Bevan Baker, the leader of the Greens, as an attempt to try to decapitate the movement, right? And they lost. So the Liberal leader lost. The Liberals were, you know, trounced back into third place polling region, even though they had three seats. But Peter Bevan Baker kept his status. He defeated the Liberal leader. And that means a lot. And you can see in, in recent polls in PEI how the Greens have really back bounced back. They're back polling uh, around that 20% area um, and, you know, would would be projected to pick up four more seats, getting them right back to where they were. So, you know, it's uh, it's one of those interesting Atlantic Canadian 
phenomenons. And now Susan's refusing to learn that lesson and trying to, you know, shoot for David Kuhn's head. But what happened was, is David chose to run in Lincoln because his riding was split up by the, uh, and by elections NB, um, yeah. who redrew the maps, which they, they do every 10 years to account for population changes. And, uh, yeah, so it's like, she's not running against the leader of the greens and yet still, uh, our friend Simone is sorry about that. Everybody, um, just hit a, hit a wrong button. So anyway, uh, Fredericton South Silverwood, um, which, you know, if you're in Fredericton, it gets really cut off there at Regent street yeah. and at the top of the hill, on uh, prospect street and goes all the way to, and I got to make sure I see this myself. Cause all the, Oh, I see it goes to Silverwood, which yes, way over sense. by <laughs> Island view area. It's got a weird map drawn through it off Woodstock road there. And up around anyway so that's silverwood you've got uh, susan holt running against nicole carlin who's the progressive conservative green um candidate simone Ulett works for qp we're seeing him actually in qp announcements right now um as they work through the things people's alliance haven't announced anybody and the ndp have nikki lyons mcfarland running so it is a full a full slate really there and mm. um, that polling data was really surprising to see um you know, it's happened to the Liberals before where they they choose to take the risk on a situation like this. And uh, instead of working with a party, just choose to, you know, go for them. And and uh, what the big the big message, I think, is that the brand is in trouble. That's what everyone keeps saying. The yeah. Liberal brand is in trouble. And yeah. you're seeing the prime minister double down. And I know there's a difference, but the difference to the uh, to an, just a regular person who isn't as sillily involved as we are okay. and those listeners out there uh the brand between provincial and federal doesn't really make a hill of beans as we say mm -hmm. um that it is something you have to grapple with the fact that you are uh mm -hmm. the same name same colors same ideals yeah. and i'm noticing a lot of discourse online about um how the liberals trying to pull the left in um, is not really working for them because they're leaving this big centrist part of the country out of the equation. And so that's why they're all drifting over to the conservatives because they're seeing more of themselves in that party than they are in the liberals. And I hadn't really thought of it that way. Yeah. Uh, I mean, until the, I recently the, read about it. Yeah. The conservative federally are, you know, eating the NDP's lunch. Mm -hmm. And um, there's a lot of people who won't vote for the liberals who, you know, are saying, well, this guy's talking about working class issues. So that that matters to me. And, yeah. you know, everything's hard and Justin Trudeau's the one in charge. So who else am I going to vote for? You know, like that's the, the piece there. And I but I do think like what is the categoric difference between federal and provincial liberals in this province? I don't know. I don't think there is any, right? I don't think they, they don't have like any delineating issues I can point to. Right. Maybe the no. carbon tax. Maybe. <laughs> um, but even that, like, I don't know. I, I saw my first hopeful thing recently. Um, and it was about how Biden's creating all of these um policies around basically ending neoliberalism and i don't see that from either provincial or federal politicians in this country where we're trying to like maybe there is some you know rumblings here and there about onshoring business but the whole concept is that we've been buying we've been cheapening our our own labor um and as such like we want everything to be dead cheap like cheap goods. And so we, we outsource it to all these countries that basically use slave labor to ensure that we can have doodads and what's its galore, uh, to quote Ariel, <laughs> for our, you know, comfort and whatnot. And that has completely undermined our ability to have jobs in, you know, manufacturing and trades and things like that. And so Canada has just become 
um, this place where everything that we were supposed to be like these like engineers and, and the thought that the smart ones, I guess, of the world and that that has backfired on us completely. And so in the US where they're talking about, you know, getting up to 70% in subsidies, if you're going to open a factory, they're, they're talking about some serious um, moving of mountains in order to get jobs back into America that mm-hmm. are not just these elite sort of positions. Mm-hmm. And so I don't see where Canada is doing some of that work. Um, maybe like, please show me like where those policies and programs I mean, exist. The only way, the only place you can point to is, you know, the industrial language that's come out of the feds has been to, you know, really spend some money on these different uh, EV plants, uh, manufacturing mm-hmm. plants in Ontario and and whatnot, and, you know, competing against the states. But I mean, the thing is about it is competition with the states is at this point a moot point. It, they're, put, they're putting trillions of dollars into their Inflationary Reduction Act and the Green New Deal and all that. Like, we don't have that kind of ability. We just don't. We don't have that kind of population. We just don't. No. Um, we have other things. And, you mm-hmm. know, I think it's... Uh, incumbent on us to uh, play on that advantage but you, you we really don't we don't hear a lot of ambition about you know the fourth industrial revolution which is what we're going through which is moving from for those of you who don't know um i know that sounds like jargon fourth industrial industrial revolution essentially first industrial revolution was moving from horse and you know beast power if you will um to get, uh, coal right and that gives us the steam engine and the and then we go from coal um did i say fourth and meant third i think i meant third <laughs> we go from coal to gas that gets us an aggregate efficiency of 30 percent, or sorry 20 up to 20 percent uh, by moving from coal to gas based on how much energy it costs us to get the thing to mm. produce the energy and now we're moving to a renewable source and electrification, which is that third industrial revolution. I'm, that's what I meant to say, not fourth. Um, and uh, that is where we're at. And so, you know, at every point and junk point here, you see some country during those industrial revolutions do better than the others, right? The British did the best with the first industrial Revo- revolution. The Americans did the best with the second. And mm-hmm. it's yet to be determined who's going to who's going to be the best with the third. Certainly China is the most uh, ambitious around electrification right now that we see. So, you know, it's people love to, you know, point out our advantage on oil and things like that. And we have our oil, you know, we've got a big oil refinery here in St. John, but in a hundred years time, that's not, that's not a source of, of pride anymore. Right. That's, that's like, (laughs) that's like having coal mines. Right. Yeah. So it's uh, yeah, you're right. There's not a big level of ambition, but the Americans certainly have turned on the turned on the pipes, if you will, around turn the yeah. taps on, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Turn the taps on as far as incentives to to move in that direction. It's pretty impressive. And I think they realize that this the, the glory days are are over of just, you know, importing cheap things and that that's the way we all just live and and carry on so uh speaking of energy one thing we haven't mentioned is the exodus of the multex ceo yes smrs were they not the all they were cracked up to be (laughs) (laughs) so what do we know on that front I think you were the one who pointed that story out to me, and we just forgot to get yeah, to it. Yeah, it's true. Um, was it? Yeah, I think it was Multex CEO. So basically, the um, I just want to pull this up. Um, exit. I think it was Multex. So yes, my mistake. It was not Multex. It was uh, Arc Clean Technology. Yep. So. The um, CEO suddenly departed in just June 26th, William Lab, um, and there was other layoff notices to staff that were that were sent out. And this was one of the sort of leading companies here making themselves known in New Brunswick around small modular reactors, mm. which are you know taking a giant nuclear reactor and making it tiny and putting it. Yeah. It's basically like, you know, pumping out the technology from nuclear submarines, which 
keeps a massive boat underwater for months at a time and you know provides energy in perpetuity right like yes um, that tech's been around for a long time but it hasn't been deployable you know in a in a to the grid, residential right? yeah or sorry not yeah. you know in a commercial setting i guess yeah so and we've doubted them on here before oh my god because you know look at the look at the quarterback quarterbacking the incentives and picking the trying to pick the winners we basically picked winners here right we said hey multex mm -hmm. hey art you guys are the ones and who picked them envy power the same people who picked or emulsion same people who picked joy scientific the same people who have picked all sorts of, you know, the point, the pro uh, refurbishment budget, which was a billion and a half dollars over. Like, these guys don't have the credibility to be around here slinging our tax dollars out as, you know, venture capital for future tech. It's pretty clear. And now they, you know, one of these main companies, ARC, lost that CEO. And do we have any sense as to why? Well, saying ARC is realigning personnel and resources to strengthen our strategic partnerships and rationalize operations to best prepare for the next phase of our deployment, the company said in a statement. Oh, God, I love PR people. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> we were deploying. We're they have such a deploy. way with words. Yeah. Um, Spin last factor. year, this, this former CEO told a legislative committee that ARC's 100-watt megawatts SMR uh, would be ready by 2030, but then uh, cut to this year uh, at the Energy Utility Board hearings, they uh, their vice president uh, of business development and strategic partnerships said that they would probably not be ready by 2030. So the Higgs government had given ARC $20 million in 2021 to help it develop its reactor. The previous liberal government had given it $10 million. So that's $30 million in taxpayer money given to one company with unproven technology. Um, it did say here, though, that the uh, the provincial funding was contingent on several benchmarks being reached. So there's it's not clear whether or not that whole $30 million was indeed spent. Um, and they are aware that this technology is still advancing and understand that restructuring is part of that process. So yeah, so not, province not had pitched look. ARC, but this is, so this is interesting. The province had actually pitched ARC and Moltex um, with this plan. So they were looking for them, not the other way around. As we know in sales, it's, it's you know, one or the other. Mm -hmm. If someone's calling you for a quote, then amazing. Uh, if not, usually companies like ARC and Moltex would be looking for NV power type customers <laughs> to sell their technology to right but they don't have a technology because they haven't created it yet mm. <laughs> and this goes back to our province being particularly susceptible to these types of um these types of monorail solutions <laughs> things that are going to be the big savior the big win the the put us on the world stage yeah situation. man yeah, it's like okay, here's a here's a wedge, and like I mean, the the Greens have always been anti-nuclear, and it's it's a position I can't support them in. But um, for them, this is a real good wedge if they really wanted to to say, well, you know, vote. I guess if you vote for the Liberals, we're just going to spend, you know, half as much as the PCs on bad ideas, right? Well, I like, mean, it's just it's, there's... It, yeah. There's so many different um, things that already work that could be implemented. District energy, wind farms. Um, yeah, none of them have the big, farms. you know, you know, none of them have this these huge potentials. Like I get it, big risk, big reward. But why would you be trying to take the big risk in a tiny province? Makes no yeah, sense. There's much we have to power here. Um, you know, we're 850,000 people now. They're sure there's some pretty significant industry, but even those industry players like JDI are building wind farms. So, yeah. and I mean, Mac um, Quack is in desperate need. So, like, stop spending money on this stuff that might not ever work. Spend the money on this stuff. And investing in like its origin story too is just so interesting. When you know there is other means to invest yeah. that kind of money into that have already proven their worth and use, right? So, yeah. Fix the actual but, nuclear station we already have. 
uh, yeah, and that's beyond life, and they're limping along mm-hmm. with it. And, but anyway, so there's there's some energy politics for you, and there's some stuff we're not hearing a lot about on the campaign trail. It surprises me a little bit that nobody's taken a shot. But of course, the only ones who are really equipped to take or who can really have the credibility to take a shot are the Greens. And so we'll have to see if David starts putting this in the window and starts talking about this at, at places or not. So. Anyway, um, on to the next issue, which we have. Um, so we did the polling, and that led us into that chat about the the riding. And, and, and Susan, now we're, we're going to move to the pastor's piece. So Phil Hutchings is back in the news. Yes. And uh, this is a, a bit of a, you know, let's say far out, Christian, uh, evangelistic, charismatic type Um you know, I know the, the type well, you know, they have these these church sessions and they look like rock concerts and they have, you know, big screens and they bring in speakers who, you know, love to spew a lot of pseudoscience and love to, you know, give themselves a round of applause on how well they know the Bible and how well they know Greek and Hebrew and how important the, the definitions are of this stuff. And everybody, you know, feels like they're onto something really big and really important and, you know, ground shaking and earth shattering and all this stuff and spiritual warfare and and i you see this guy's like feed and it has this stuff between that stuff and then you know putting his kids in on display to say hey look at my cute kid on the drums or whatever and it's like a little bit tokenizing um but you know whatever we uh we all have kids and it's it is what it is but to see him with blaine and a business bible uh praying with blaine higgs was a bit of a trip this week yeah, what is a business Bible? Can you please enlighten me on what that well, is? Yeah, so in the world of, let's call it non-conformist, unorthodox theology. And what do I mean by unorthodox theology? In any sort of discipline, you have the orthodox tradition and you have the outliers, right? So within Christianity, you got 2,000 years of history, you have the split between the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic Church in about the 7th, 8th century, 8th, 9th century, sorry. Uh, And then you get the Protestant Reformation in about the 14th century, uh, Martin Luther, and and that spreads out into a bunch of other areas. But there's sort of an Orthodox theological position on a lot of different issues. Some they have in common, some they do not. I'm not going to explain it all, but let's just put it this way. In the pseudo world of theology, right? fast theology, you know, dressed up, disguised as, you know, credible, you get these one-off versions of, of Bibles and, you know, um, textbook, Trump Bible. textbook style things that, that illustrate what they want you to know about. So my guess is the business Bible probably um, goes through and highlights the areas of the Bible that speaks to business. Now, I don't know what the business Bible is going to do with Exodus 23, which talks about the fair price that you can demand for, you know, your daughter to be sold into slavery. Um, if, they're, if, if they're, you know, crossbred with Hittites, um, I don't know what the business Bible is going to say about that. But it's supposedly that's what these types of special interest Bibles do. They go through and they highlight it. And then you'll get some theologian or pastor type person right in the comment section on the bottom to say, you know, this passage clearly says A, B, and C. And for reference, go check out passages D, E, and F. And, you know, this is important for your blah, 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 blah. Like it kind of just gives you a commentary. Um, So that's my guess about about that. Um, I've never read it. (laughs) I've read probably about nine different versions of the Bible. Um, And by versions, I mean versions like this, where there's sort of like a bent to the -hmm. the commentary in the Bible. and then within the Bible, you have translations. So I don't know what translation of the Bible, the business Bible would use. There's sort of like a dozen credible translations that, you know, mm-hmm. have real authors or real scholars who know the language, who are looking at original texts from the Dead Sea Scrolls or you know, the Vulgate or, you know, those very old versions of the Bible that go back to fifth, sixth century, you know, mm-hmm. stuff. But to, um 
I don't know which one this is. Anyway, that's the business Bible. Sorry for this boring lecture. <laughs> no, it's just interesting because, you know, I just watched the uh, America's Sweethearts, the story of the Dallas <laughs> Cowboys cheerleader squad. Oh, you're such a chick. And I am very much a, a woman's, woman's woman. But yeah, so anyway, I was just really surprised with, um, they all go to this like church and uh, in this this you know texas is of course known for its big mega churches and this one they go to is like god loves dallas god loves dallas god loves dallas and the whole thing is like you know you will be prosperous if you just believe and you just you know keep showing up and it's in god's hands so all these young women who are like dying to be on this cheer squad are super invested in this you know prosperity gospel stuff and are showing up and making sure they're there and there's this whole other, you know, scene with like um, the, them all, you know, basically they're all kind of on this like marriage track, baby track. This is like their, their young, their young moment in their career. And then after that, they're kind of going to go on to, there's some definitely some like career women in there too. But again, it has a lot to do with this, like God is going to provide for me and I will be rewarded if I just right. believe. I believed a lot of that. From the yeah. from probably, from probably from 2010, no, I guess even earlier, 2009 to about mm -hmm. 2012, that would have been a dispositional belief I had theologically about the prosperity gospel. Um, and I think that's what we see with Phil's. Oh and yeah, a ton oh, of the absolutely. mutual friends that I have with Phil. Same are, with um, Yeah, are very much same with 18. It's like, and when you see these types of people who have these big followings and congregations and all of this, like you, why wouldn't you believe that you'll just be prosperous if you, Oh yeah. It's, it's, it's a poet song, you know, it's a, what do they call it? Something in pony dance or show Yeah. dog and pony dog, show dog, dog and pony show. Yeah. There we go. You know, it's a, it's a big show. Right. And you know, when you're in the early stages of church planting, you're on the cutting edge and you're on the apostolic ministry and you're doing the hard work and you're trudging forward and you're pioneering and everybody wants to come and encourage you and plant that church and plant that church and do that work and get those people to come in and, you know, glad hand everybody and high five everybody and be super positive and everybody loves to come and put on, you know, use those resources well. And then you turn the, and then there's a turning point where you get the building, you get the stage, you get the fog machine, you get the screens, you get the, the full setup band musicians and um, instruments and then it's all about, well, let's go to this guy's flashy church, blah, blah, blah. It's like the prosperity gospel is a very unorthodox um, position. It's not one that Christians believed for thousands of years. It's about a hundred, it's about a hundred years old as a belief system within the church. It's a, right. you know, it's a novelty item, uh, but it's also like a brainwashing tool. It's a manipulation tool. Um, if you get people believing they can be better off by having the right faith and spirituality and formation to their life and discipline, then you can get them on the hook to continue to, to, to buy what you're selling. Right. Well, so you're, here's the, a you're the only one who's selling it. This is an interesting like quote on here that I think speaks to the current political climate here in New Brunswick from Phil. And it's not from him. It's from uh, Rodney and Adonica Howard Brown. And the quote goes, which was posted on June 26. I tell you by the Holy Ghost, in the next three months, there's going to be an acceleration in signs and wonders. You better get ready to see the greatest manifestation of miracles. It's already happening. It's not something that will happen sometime in the next five years. These next three months shall be a display of the glory of God. And what is happening in New Brunswick in the next three months? An election. Hey. <laughs> so. It's so, you know, it's like, I've heard this stuff for so long, you guys. It's so pathetic and it's so frustrating because I spent so much of my life in meetings where this stuff was going on and the anticipation is growing and it's leading somewhere. And then when you get to that place where the thing is supposed to happen, it's all fabricated and you can tell people are a little bit like, oh, it didn't really happen like we wanted to, but let's make sure that people feel like it's still happening and it's like signs and wonders miracles people rising from the dead people getting blessed with money like god it just doesn't stop with, with this um canada's best days are now Christ, canada for hashtag canada for christ uh, so 
Yeah. It really like tying nationalism to Christianity, to politics, to God, to prosperity. Um, it's to me like it, it really feels like, yeah, like you say, like a dog and pony show. And if you just, mm -hmm. you know, get the pretty wife and pretty kids and pretty situation going for yourself, like that will absolutely everything will just come through for you and you will be as prosperous as me. Yep. I know. Anyways. Um, so how does that relate politically? Well, Blaine Higgs is here campaigning. He's on the campaign trail. Like the writ hasn't dropped, but the campaign trail is, no. is on. And Susan is certainly yeah. doing her part to get around the province. Kudos to her on that. Um, you know, she's putting a lot of communication about where she's going, what's going on. And, um, not necessarily, I'm not necessarily seeing anything else from the candidates. A couple candidates I see pop, pop up, like candidates who are busy and yeah, doing that work sure. and campaigning, but, but not a lot. Um, and so it's, uh, Steve Outhouse is doing his job for sure. Blaine Higgs is, mm -hmm. um, <laughs> Steve Outhouse is now a pig feeding from two troughs, as they say. He is now working for the Progressive Conservative Party as Blaine Higgs campaign manager, and He's working for the provincial government as, uh, what's his title again? My gosh. I just forgot the name of his. Oh, the um, secretary, yeah. the premier, something like that. The secretary's secretary. position. Yeah, yeah, which is a government, it's actually a government position. And just so you know, guys, party structures have their structure and have their organization and have their funding and have their employees. They aren't supposed to be the same <laughs> in many ways as those that are in government positions. The government is supposed to be nonpartisan, supposed to be, you know, there to take the direction that has been set by the legislation or legis the legislature through legislation and enact it, right? Um, mm -hmm. So when you've got somebody who's running a campaign, who's there to play a role of, you know, representing the, 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 the direction of government, it becomes pretty cloudy. And, yeah. you know, Steve, Steve is doing his job at keeping Blaine in the basement right now. Blaine, you don't see Blaine at very many places. He knows his approval rating's low. He knows putting him in front of people is going to create awkward situations where people boo him, where people don't want to talk to him, where people aren't showing up for the rally like they'd hoped, and the crowd will be empty. Like, he knows that's not going to play well. So this is the strategy. And so Blaine didn't post this picture of him and Phil on his... No. It was on Phil's. So you got to dig. Yeah. You got to dig to find out what the premier's doing. Got to know where to look. <laughs> yeah. As they say. No. Yeah. But it's just an, I, you know, we're seeing so much difference across the board in the types of candidates. And the other story we wanted to talk about today was uh, drive in gate. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So there was <laughs> lots. You're probably going to still see it pop up, even though it's actually been canceled now. But uh, Don Moynihan, 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 yeah, so. Moynihan, who recently invested into the KOA uh, Sussex Drive-In, which is a very beloved uh, place here in, in southern New Brunswick, because, you know. My parents had a trailer there for a while. I actually was homeless for three weeks there. Right. I kid you not. Life. And people are like, we're homeless? Like, yeah, I couldn't move into the house we had bought in 19. But our landlord had absolutely demanded we, you know, leave the premises. So we were, we had three weeks of, of time where we had, so I lived at my parents' summer trailer at the KOA. Yeah, it's a beautiful spot. And uh, Mr. Moynihan is uh, running for office for Butternut Arcadia. What is it? That's a, yeah. it's a long one. Butternut Valley. Arcadia, Arcadia, Butternut, Arcadia, Butternut Valley. And somewhere else. Does, yeah, Something anyway. Hills. Yeah. So yeah, anyway, yeah, he uh, recently got the nomination, had, uh, we talked a little bit about him last week, where a counselor from Chris Pam had given him an endorsement. Um, and he was a former, it said former city counselor. And so I was super curious. I didn't understand where. Uh, turns out it was a spot in Quebec, just north of Montreal, where he was on city council there for about nine years mm. uh, before deciding to not to reoffer and to move back to New Brunswick. So he's been out of province for quite some time. I think it's around like 20 something years and has moved back into rural NB. Uh, he is originally from here um, and has been away, has come back. And so what happened this week, though? 
he chose two different movies for a throwback Thursday event, so E.T. and Grease, and um, decided that those would be PCNB fundraisers. But they did not put that in the title. If you had to read the entire description on Facebook, go to the very bottom and it was like, this event is a PCNB fundraiser. Um, and that was all there was. So people were visibly upset about it. Well, I mean, it's, and, it's Trojan yeah. horse political fundraising. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's, it, gosh, there's just, there's so many rules around it. Oh God, um, you can't do that. You can't, yeah. you can't put on events for parties and like that's against campaign finance stuff. Like, yes, it sure yeah. is. Um, so the comment section, there was comments getting deleted. There oh, yeah. was, you know, shares all over the place about this stuff. And, um, People really up in arms about the deception there. So what was your take on it? Oh, I just thought, like, God, like, what an amateur hour mistake. Somebody didn't, like, obviously, our good friend Steve Outhouse, who won't talk to us, um, <laughs> obviously, he doesn't know about this. He would have headed that off at the pass a long before and said, look, you don't want to take the risk here to seem like you're trying to deceive people into funding your campaign, right? put more notices out, make it a fundraiser. If you're going to do that, it probably was for Don's own campaign, right? Like it was, it's, it's like, if you want to make larger do donations, the link was right to his own um, PCNB page. Right. And so, you know, this is a business owner who has a business that has to answer to the public or that doesn't have to answer to the public. Um, he can do what he wants. But as soon as he puts on the other hat of I'm a candidate running for office, he is he's accountable to the public, right? Yeah. I mean, that party gets public money, right? The All the parties that get votes in New Brunswick um, receive party funding or financing from tax dollars. Um, yes. I forget what the vote, what the dollar per vote is. It's like, anyway, um, that's the model we use. And so you have to get 15% of the vote in your riding in order to get your money that you spent back. Yes. But um, there's also money that you get for each vote. So uh, that's why it rewards parties running a full slate of candidates, right? Because each vote matters when it comes to cash. And yes. so, but they got to be accountable for this stuff and you can't, you can't use party money to do stuff like this as a candidate. And so, you know. I just can't even imagine like how insanely infuriated um, PCs or or liberals would be if like the Greens pulled this or if liberals pulled this. The <laughs> other like it just so I have to think that this was expected. And in, the other side of me is like, oh wow, the backfire view is that this really platformed this guy. This really you know gave a lot of exposure to this particular person right yeah because there's i've said oh, you know what PR, yeah talk sorry i was that. just going to add to that like this is yeah. this campaign we're talking about campaigns here this this election is going to answer the question once and for all does bad press actually help because people will say there's no such thing as bad press right yeah, so no, it's not a problem that Fatine's on getting all this coverage uh yeah. for all of her work and you know sean rouse is putting you know, Blaine Higgs on, on every video and it's good for them, right? They're, they're getting airwaves. It's like, we're going to find out if these candidates who have made some pretty major mistakes, like, I mean, this is a gaffe. It's not a, I don't think this is a, you have to dismiss this candidate. This is an amateur mistake is what it is. Mm -hmm. I don't think the PCs are going to kick him out, but yeah, they canceled everything. It all got yeah. reset. Right. So, yeah. But, um, you know, when it comes to some of the, you know, the background, you know, checking on some candidates and, you know, being accountable to their past and putting, you know, uh, people like Fatine in the window, uh, who, who could get a ton of bad press. Um, we're going to find out. And it's not just that. It's Don, it's Kimmy Blondie, it's, um, or what's her real, Constance, sorry, Blondie. Yeah. She has a profile or whatever. It's, uh, there's a couple of candidates. I mean, I'm waiting to see if some of the crazy information that, you know, I've heard from PCs about um, Nicole Carlin are going to drop, mm, right? Yeah. I mean, that girl's got a real 
checkered past. Um, and the stuff that's gone on, um, you know, it, it could drop. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, like there's, it's, it's one of those things where is bad press really bad news for your campaign? This will be the ultimate, the ultimate test. Yeah, it's true. I so. don't know. It's a, it's an election for the ages. No question. There is, there is a lot of, uh, even just, gosh, I just Googled Fatine here on Facebook to go see what she's been up to. And, uh, when you, when you, when you just throw her into Facebook, like you get all these old things, like here's one from June 2nd, 2021, vaccinate your child question mark. <laughs> it's like, Oh my God. So <laughs> there's just been, we're dealing with uh, Phil Hutchins too, who almost, he was in, he was in court about bringing together oh, yeah. people during COVID. Right. Yeah. So there's, there's just, this is really the first post COVID election. Will some of these controversial views about vaccinations, homeschooling, uh, government intervention, all those things, are those yeah. still issues that are top of mind to voters or have we moved on? I don't know. Yeah. I have no idea. Hard to say not knowing, as we say. Um, Hard to say not knowing. It's, yeah, it's going to be interesting. But campaigns matter. And, you know, it's like the problem. And we've talked about this because I'm currently getting crucified upside down by about a dozen people uh, in St. John over this project that we've been working on because they don't want it in their backyard. They don't want it in their neighborhood. We're going to ruin their neighborhood and put drug dealers in their living room and all this, you know, just hyperbole, right? Um, yeah. And, like, you made a good point last night talking about it. It's like, there's around 30,000 people that live in the west side of the city. There are, is that the number? Is it 30? Mm -hmm. Okay. Close around 5,000 of them voted last time. And there's a dozen on here, you know, taking shots, taking yeah. a lot of shots, like posting on multiple places, like boom, like just throwing met, like comment after comment, message after message. And, you know, I'm doing my best to kind of stick with it and talk to them and answer questions and, you know, call out misrepresentation and call out bad actors and all that but i mean you can't you don't have the time to police that all day and night um but yeah it's like will any of that matter how much of the electorate actually hears about this stuff um, but what they do remember is meeting you at the door or, or they meet you at an event or seeing something that you've done online and and you know seeing your what you're talking about and going mm -hmm. to a website and clicking around and you know talking to a neighbor about whoever, you know, whatever candidate, that's the stuff that does matter in this campaign. Um, and so I do, I do think Susan's doing a, a pretty good job being aggressive and getting around the province with this. Yeah. You know, I forget what the tour was that she called it. A speak, Change like, tour. What's that? Change tour. Change tour. Yeah. I wonder if it's going to be like the labor party in, in the UK where the change is in tiny letters. Yeah right oh gosh small yeah, amount change of uh -huh. um we'll see right yeah but, uh, that's the stuff you gotta do um that's gonna wrap us up this week we're a little short on time it's got i got another meeting i gotta run to um we are gonna take the week off next week we're gonna try to line up some guests thank you to all of our patreon um supporters out there you guys are rock 